The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Zurich Australia Limited, ABN 92000 010 195 AFSL 232 510 and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks from Ensemble, and I'm thrilled to be bringing to you uh, the podcast Engine Room. It's devoted entirely to the practices or the business of the business of financial advice. Over the course of the next many months, we're going to be interviewing Australia's best independent boutique advice firms, their practice managers, their GMs, on what environment is conducive to being a best practice how they keep talent, how they attract talent, and what the future of financial advice is. It's the Engine Room Podcast. Welcome aboard. Zurich is proud to be supporting this episode. The Zurich and OnePath Advisor portal is more efficient than ever before, giving you access to two leading brands with three highly sought-after products, underpinned by two powerful underwriting engines, all with one simple sign-on, making it easier for you to do business and perform at your best. Hi, my name's Andrew Rocks, and welcome to another edition of the Engine Room Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Bree Stevens, who's the General Manager of Blueprint Wealth in Western Australia, um, and we're talking across the Nullarbor, um, and uh, I, uh, it's, it's a, a lot earlier, so I'd like to thank Bree. She's, she's looking a lot more perky than I am down the barrel of the camera. So without any further ado, welcome to the Engine Room. Bree, how are you? Good. I'm great, Roxy. Thanks for having me today. And look, we've had a bit of a chat earlier, and uh, Kieran, the sound guy, has uh, scaffolded us. We had a couple of uh, probably self-inflicted tech issues, which all 100% were mine. But what we always like to start with is finding out a little bit of the history of how you found yourself running what honestly is a very large uh, financial planning practice in, in Perth. So, Bree, did you... When you finished school, did you say that was my ambition or what, what's your story as far as how you got there? Yeah, sure. Um, I guess for me, when I finished school, when I started uni, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. So I, I started off doing a commerce degree and when I was doing that, they had just introduced financial planning as a major. So really didn't have any idea what that was. Um, I always enjoyed numbers, but liked working with people. And when I did a bit more research and understood what financial planning was, then made the decision to focus on that and do that as my degree. Um, as I was doing that study, I really wanted to then actually start working and put it to practice and make sure I did enjoy what I was doing. So at that point, I started working part-time at Blueprint Wells, which is still where I am now, 22 years later. So um, I think so that's this was really your first corporate job, that is that right? It was, yes. Yep. So i um, I haven't haven't moved. I've been here for 22 years and gone through all the different iterations of different roles in the business and tried pretty much every role that you can do in financial planning before settling on um, the role that I'm in now as general manager, which I, I really enjoy doing. So, um, uh, so I guess taking that risk and picking financial planning as a major, knowing nothing about it, turned out to be a, a good decision for me. And having a quick sneak at your your bio, you grew up in a in a household um, where your parents were self employed. Is is that correct? So you've gone, you've you've grown up in that environment. But then the very first corporate job you found, you've obviously liked the individuals in your state. So what was it like growing up in a, in a, in a family where where your parents are self employed? Yeah, well, I think um, my dad had his own business, and he actually had a, a similar pathway to me, where he started working there straight after uni and stayed there through to when he retired as well. And I was able to watch him through that journey, do the different roles, grow a successful business, uh, and then be able to to sell out of that and and have a, a happy retirement. Um, watching him do that and learning a lot of business lessons from him and having those conversations with him really helped me shape my work ethic and, and how I wanted to be involved with Blueprint. You know, when I first started at Blueprint, there was four people in the business. Um, that very much had a, a family feel right from the beginning. 
Um, and I was very lucky because as the business continued to grow, um, I was able to try different different hats on in the business and and have a go at different areas and understand what I like doing. And we we're always encouraged to give our feedback and input on on what worked and didn't work. And if we wanted to change something, then go ahead and do it. So we've always had a lot of autonomy in what we were doing, which we've continued as the culture of the business today. Um, but I think having that autonomy and having my my family as kind of those role models has really helped me shape how I wanted to grow in my career and, and grow Blueprint as a business as well. And who was the person in the organisation that um, gave you the job? Are they still there? They are, yeah. So David Brufy, the, one of the founding directors, um, went through the, the interview process and, and hired me. Um, and David's always been really supportive of, of anything I wanted to do. So always very hands off and, and let me do what I needed to do and listened when he needed to and took on that feedback. And, and I think one of the great things about working with David was him recognising that, uh, you know, once the business gets to a certain size, there's a limit to what uh, an advisor can do as a business owner. So understanding that you need someone to work on the business, not in the business, and and that created a lot of opportunities for me to to go through um, and help shape how the business grew over time. Um, and Dave has always been really supportive of of helping me do that and giving me opportunities to grow and and do further study to help me continue to, to be better at what I'm doing and, and shape the business to what it is today. We might touch on um, sort of the further study that you've done to, to better yourself a bit later, but you know the comment that you made about uh, David being one of the founders and, um, and having the self-awareness as an advisor um, to actually bring in someone who initially your role wasn't GM, but then to you know, actually work with you to build out that capability um, I see that a lot in successful practices. I see that the advisors who um, pick a lane and either want to go yep. into advice or want to go in there are the ones that, that do grow a scaled business. And, and we'll touch on the numbers, yep. the size of your business in a second. So um, well done to David for a bit of self-awareness. And the story about your parents, and I think your, your father had a quantity surveying um, business. Um, he did. So at what stage, so when you were just starting Blueprint, was he doing a sale and exiting and, and scaling? Because, geez, that would have been a, a, a fast-track knowledge for, that you could take to work every day. Yeah, I, I think probably when I started working, Dad was still very much full-time and, you know, working nights and, and weekends, which may or may not have been a good role model in terms of work-life balance. But, um, you know, he'd often come home and tell us about what the business was doing and contracts they were working on and um, talk about people management and potentially frustrations they were having or um, ways they were doing to get people to buy into the business to to get their engagement and, and commitment to the business. So I think having those conversations when I was then having conversations with David and, and other members of Blueprint, I had a bit of context around how small businesses operate and things that we needed to be aware of and, and learnt from some of Dad's successes and failures about what worked and didn't work. So being able to have those conversations and, and I still often go to dad and use him as a sounding board when I'm trying to work through business decisions and, and personal decisions as well. So having someone from a completely different industry who is acting as a role model has been something that that I've really valued uh, and appreciated over my career so far. Well, shout out uh, Bree's dad. I'm not <laughs> sure if he's got the same, same surname or different, but I'm giving him a shout out because I, I yeah. genuinely love those stories in my own Backstory is quite similar with my grandfather playing that role over the years. Now you clearly um, you've you, 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 you've started off and uh, and you had four men that were were working with you. You say you, in your bio you're married. Yep. You've got a you've got a son. Do you have a boy dog? Um, like there's a lot of those around. But then at the very end you you, you say, but I've got a circle of quite close girlfriends. Um, yeah. who, who sort of balanced that? Has that been, um, have you had these, these friends forever and have they also helped shape you in your role? Because you didn't start as yeah. general manager. You, you, you really had to go through in what is quite a male dominated industry over the last 21 years. Um, yeah. How, how has that, how has that shaped you? I think if I look at, I've probably got six close girlfriends and one of them, um, my best friend is my best friend from primary school. We went through primary school and high school together. Um, you know, I'm godparents to each other's children um, and the rest of them are, are best friends from high school. So I think 
loyalty and uh, commitment is really important to me. And, you know, having that background and history with them, you know, we, we often talk about work and, and what they're doing and, and career decisions. And they're all in similar positions to me where they're, you know, um, working professional women who have children, they're married, you know, they all have the same challenges that I do in trying to you know, find that work-life balance and, you know, make decisions around family versus career and, and what's important and, and how to get that right. Um, so, again, I, I also go to them for advice and, you know, to share ex- each other's successes and it's amazing to have that support from um, such a amazing group of females who have always been there for me. So, um, I know I've got a lot of people I can lean on if I ever need help and advice, so I'm very lucky to have that. Well, we've probably got six extra listeners on the podcast because uh, they'll have to now. You've said something really yeah. nice about them. So um, it must also, before we move on to sort of talking a bit about the business, um, why I wanted you to come on is is um, you, you are definitely part of the cohort of the next generation of people driving financial planning. Why that is, is that you're you're an owner of the business. You're you you've you've never been an advisor. You were an advisor for a, a year or two, is that right? And then you went power planning, but you're you're very much yeah. running the business of the business, um, and you've 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 got an ownership. You've got a share in the game, and you know. Yep. At what stage did you get ownership in the in this business? Pretty early on, um, I think after about five years working at Blueprint, um, I was offered the ability to to buy shares in in the business and over time um, was given more opportunity to increase that shareholding. Um, we also have an employee share options scheme, so I was able to buy more shares through that as well. So it's been an opportunity that's offered to to many people in our business, you know, who do add value outside of what they do. And, and you know, we've always taken the approach that we want people to, to come to work because they enjoy it and it's rewarding for them, but also give them the opportunity to grow their own personal wealth through helping the business become successful and profitable. So, um, yeah, I've, I've had those opportunities and taken them up when I can um, to, you know, align what I do. And, you know, everyone spends a lot of time at work and you often spend more time with your, your work family than you do with your real family. So, Having that commitment from others in the business and those long-term relationships um, is a really important part of our, our business and, and culture. And I, I love the fact that, that when you described um, that people uh, through the ESOP have an ability to uh, get shares, but also grow their own personal wealth. Um, you know, coming to work and culture is is more about more than just sort of having shiny desks and and and, and you know um, rented plants. Actually, being able to move the dial on on current and future um, people's personal wealth with their husbands, their wives, their children yeah. um, is 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 definitely also a hallmark of a good business. But let's change gears and, and talk about the business. So, you started with four. Um, what's yep. the what's the headcount of, of Blueprint as we speak? Uh, we've got about twenty eight team members in Australia, and we've got about fifteen um, people that work in the Philippines that work with virtual business partners that have been with us for uh, about seven or eight years now. So, as far as we're concerned, they're part of our team. So, probably around forty five in total. Yeah. So from five to forty five, um, and uh, over twenty odd years, and that's that's literally Moore's law. That's doubling every every other year um, again, and What's the organisational structure? So let's start with yourself. So you, you're the general manager. Do you report to to uh, the, the C-suite or are you a part of the C-suite in, in the business effectively? Um, so I report through to the board. Um, the board is, I guess, more probably the, the hygiene factor of making sure we're meeting governance and, and whatever we need to do. Um, we then have a, a leadership team, which has um, David, who's our managing director, and myself, and then uh, several other um, senior financial planners and our compliance manager. So we meet monthly to, to go through all different issues of the business and, you know, figure out what we need to do and make sure that we get input from key stakeholders from all different areas of the business. Um, we've always wanted to take the approach that it's not, you know, one way is the best way and, you know, there's not one smartest person in the room. We want to have everyone contributing and, and feeling heard and you know, people confide in different people about different things. So having representatives from different roles and different areas of the business we've found has been 
um, successful in, in making sure that we do have that feedback from across the business as we continue to grow. And when did when did you um, take up that structure with the board? How many years ago? The leadership team has been in place probably for at least um, ten years. Um, I had different members in it over over time, but um, yeah, it is, it's been successful. So we've continued operating under that model. What, what I've what I've found in my observations are that. Businesses, even businesses that may not be of the scale that you're at yet, and I'm sure that you've got larger ambitions, which we'll come to it um, uh, uh, towards the end of the the, the podcast. Um, but those businesses who put in place structures as if they're a big professional firm end up becoming a big professional firm. Those businesses that are always kicking the tin down the road um, yep. and not putting that extra effort in seem just to to always stall. Would that be a fair comment? Yeah, I, I think so. I think, um, you know, we, we've always tried to take the approach that we wanted to continue to grow and we made sure that we had capacity in the business to do that. So always thinking about what was next and, and what people's career um, ambitions and career paths looked like to make sure we could cater for that. Um, and then as opportunities presented ourselves, presented to us, then we were able to take advantage of that because we'd already positioned ourselves to do that and had you know, the, the capacity to do that with some of our staff and, and understanding what they are interested in and what they needed more exposure to. And then also, you know, with that the range of people on the leadership team, they've got different relationships with different people outside of our business. So, you know, tapping into their networks and, and their connections to learn best practice and different ideas and, you know, get access to potential opportunities as they come up. So always challenging uh, what we did just to do it better and one of our key values is another way and that's something we talk about all the time with the team about encouraging them to give us feedback, let us know what we need to do better, what we can do differently. They're the experts in their role so we don't need to tell them how to do it. They need to tell us how to do it and what they need to be successful in their role. So um, that's that's always worked well for us. So another way is one of your, 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 your pillars and um, yep. that's – that um, slogan really only works if if the person in your role and the CEO genuinely provides an environment where people feel like they can they can give those and and clearly clear that's something that you've done. Um, now, apart from yourself and the people that you work with um, out in the C suite, how do you yep. then arrange the rest of the business? Um, is the uh, how many advisors are there out of the the twenty eight um, in, in Australia? Uh, so there are eight full-time advisors. Um, yep. The way the business is set up is we operate in pods. So each pod has two advisors. They have an associate advisor and a relationship manager, which is like a client services role, um, and then a power planner that works with them. And then they're supported by our offshore team to help them with the the admin work. Uh, we probably moved that model probably three or four years ago now, um, and it took and us a while going? to I, settle. I, 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 it's uh, to pot or not to pot is something that we always, um, we, we, we talk to people. Um, so yeah. Yeah, so three or four years in, um, still teething or are we, we, we slick? No, it's, it's, working, it's working really well. I think when we first started talking about it, we spent time talking with the team to understand what they did in their role and what their pain points were. And we really tried to design it so that we matched the right people with the right roles and where they can add value. So rather than having, you know, hybrid roles where people are trying to do a bit of everything and, and feeling pretty stretched, we wanted to make sure that they could focus on what they're best at and where they add the most value um, and get the most enjoyment out of what they're doing. So by operating in those pod structures, it allows people to be more focused on what they want to do. And it also gives a, a clearer pathway for progression because you know very clearly what the different roles in the business are, what's required of them, um, what the expectations and qualifications are. So it gives people that that clear pathway for progression as well. So it's it's worked well for us. Absolutely. And the key take out of that is that um, uh, having people doing half jobs uh, means that as their manager, it's hard to have any sense of accountability. I'm assuming, and we'll get to the people that section. I'm assuming that you you run a pretty tight ship on the HR. Your team have have the, the, the roles they're expected to do, the training that, that that you want them to do, what their critical numbers are. Um, it, you're furiously nodding away. Doesn't translate that way yeah. well to <laughs> podcasting. So uh, feel free to elaborate. Yeah. 
Yeah, we do. So I think, um, again, as we put those pods in place, we uh, then outlined what their KPIs are and, and really talked about where they can add the most value in their role. Um, as a business, we've got um, key strategic goals that, that we share with the team um, in quarterly updates that we do. So when we set individual KPIs, we align them to the business KPIs to give that transparency around how what they're doing on a day-to-day basis actually impacts on the business as a whole to give people more transparency around why they're doing what they're doing. So um, having that alignment and then being able to communicate that regularly with the team so they understand the impact of what they're doing um, is is something that uh, we continue to, to refine and review those goals and those targets every year. Um, but that way people have a better understanding of, of what they should be spending time on. So, you know, not getting caught up in things that don't add value, but knowing what they actually need to focus on uh, to be successful in their role. So you mentioned um, uh, you're pretty crystal clear about all of those points. Um, I have two questions. The first one is, so just repeating that you've got uh, one pod has two ARs, an associate, a relationship yep. manager, power planner, and then some operational yep. uh, support um, the, across a team. Okay. So Correct. do eat, which means that it feels like you've got four or five pods across the company. Would that be about right? Yes, four pods across the business. So, so first question is, does each of those ARs or whoever's leading that pod, do they have P&L accountability for their their revenue and the costs associated? So do you run like do you run a little sort of almost a, a, a semi competitive system? Um, so they don't have individual P and Ls, but they do have um, revenue targets for each pod. Um, and so each pod has what we call a pod leader, and they are part of the leadership team. So they are responsible for reporting back to the leadership team about how their pod's going, um, any performance issues, any challenges they're having or, or what else that they need. Um, so they've got that accountability for you know thinking about not just their own performance but the, the pod and their underlying team performance to, to report back to the leadership team. Well, that answered my second question, which is yep. when you've got two advisors, what's the strategy around that? But clearly you've then got a lead advisor – and yeah. you've almost got a succession plan that as the, the headcount of the, the clients grow, potentially they can go off and, and, and the person who's sort of second chair at the moment could become a lead advisor and you've got yeah. that ability to grow your business. Is that right? It is. So each of the associates in the pod um, will go through and do their professional year and, and two out of four of them are doing that at the moment. And the intention is for them to continue working with the advisors they're working with at the moment. Um, and then begin to do joint appointments with those advisors for them to start to build their own client books while they're still working in an associate role. So that way, when they are ready to transition into an advisor role, they're not starting from scratch with no clients. They've already had a lot of meeting experience and they've already, um, you know, jointly onboarded clients, which they can then use as their, their own client base to begin building out the next pod of the business. Um, yeah, it, and it, oh, sorry, it's, it softens the cost J curve if they, if does. they can, if they can participate and, and sort of, it smooths out that, that, that hole. Cause if you, it, it also probably keeps them motivated because if they had to start from scratch, um, um, then, then would be sort of a, a long road. So, yeah. Yeah. I was just going to add, so, um, out of the eight advisors, seven of them are pretty tenured advisors, you know, kind of around 10 plus years. Uh, and we do have one newer advisor who has just transitioned through from the associate role. So of all the experienced advisors, most of them are pretty close to capacity with client numbers. So we have a, a system in place where we encourage the advisors to onboard new clients and pass them on to the new advisor so that the whole business is focused on feeding that new advisor to get them up to capacity so then we can replicate that and do that for the next person so we can support them in their growth journey and they're not you know, left out on their own to start from scratch. They're supported not just by their pod, but by the, the whole business to, uh, to feed them and get them up to, to where they need to be. So, so I get why you're doing that from an overall company perspective, but if I play devil's advocate and I'm one of the lead advisors, what motivation yeah. have I got? Um, financially or professionally to to be filling up the next person's? Are, are they all 
equity holders? Like, I just want to get a feel for how you structured debt. Yeah, yeah. Um, some of them are equity holders, but we have a, a revenue share arrangement in place for clients that they do pass on to other advisors. So there's an incentive for them to find those clients and pass them on um, through that revenue share arrangement. And that's an ongoing arrangement. It's not just a one-off payment. They continue to receive part of the ongoing revenue for the client for their lifetime. So there's also an incentive to them to help mentor that newer advisor and, and help them maintain that client relationship. So who does the financials? I'm trying to track all of that. Is, is that which, which one of these poor people on your website have that job? Uh, that would be me. Uh, and it's certainly not <laughs> the most exciting part of my job. Um, but we do have systems set up where we can tag and, and track particular clients and a lot of different advisor codes to help us capture where revenue needs to go. Um, but it, it is it is a complex setup, but um, it's all touch wood running pretty smoothly at the moment. Well, I, I love it. I love it. So, um, and how do you, so you've, you've spoken about revenue, but um, uh, with someone on the finger on the pulse as far as productivity, um, how do you measure the the the, the productivity of your of your power planners, your relationship? You know, is it do you have critical numbers that cascade to you? So you've got your finger on the pulse. I'm going to keep asking questions. Do you do daily huddles? Give me a bit of a feel yeah. how you can get a handle on the cost side of the ledger because uh, the revenue side you've explained it is quite self explanatory, and yeah. even with the handoff you've given a good sort of explanation as well. Yeah. So the the different teams do have daily huddles each morning just to go through what they've got on. If there's anything we need to communicate to them, we can share at that point. If people are sick or on leave, then we can share that work around. So we try to encourage people not just to work in their pod, not just work in a silo, but to work across their team as well. So um, alongside that, they then have their KPIs so they know what they need to be focusing on. Um, which then tie back into the quarterly presentations that we do to the team on the balance scorecard and, and going through the financials and, and what they need to be focusing on and, and how their teams and their pods have performed. So all, all of those things help us understand what they're spending time on. Um, we also use Salesforce as our CRM system and it's one that we've set up uh, for us specifically. So we've designed it to to what we need it to do. Um, so through that uh, has a great level of, of reporting and transparency around what we need to capture. So each um, individual has a dashboard that they can look at um, whenever they need to, to understand oh, wow, what they've awesome. got in their pipeline um, and, you know, where things are stuck to identify um, potential bottlenecks and things like that, um, which then feeds through into management dashboards that we can look at at any time uh, as well. So, um, yeah, having that reporting and that transparency certainly makes it easier to keep track of, of what everyone's doing and identify bottlenecks and things we need to work on as well. And I think by having quarterly um, sort of intense catch-ups, Isn't from it? your position, you're only 12 weeks away from discovering a major problem with the business. Um, yeah. So by, by quite often people will do annual reviews. And it's just too long. It's too long um, because within a quarter, you can fix an operational issue and the clients probably haven't realized. But if they've gone a whole a whole cycle of, of reporting and they're about to get there the next year, that was also – so has that been something – you know, have you identified at any stage and gone, oh, I'm glad we picked that up? Like any mistakes that you guys have, 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 have made? Because you only learn from mistakes. Yeah. I, look, I think – through the particular areas that we measure in the balance scorecard, it helps us understand, you know, if we start to see a trend of something going wrong, we can then work with that particular team to understand what's going wrong or, or what the issues are and then adapt. Um, so a good example of that was uh, we have all our clients on 12-month annual advice agreements. Um, and what we were finding was we weren't getting as many of them in before that 12-month agreement expired. Um, which we picked up through doing this reporting, so we were a able to change that that process, which was only a you know a little tweak to what we needed the system to do, but it improved that uh, that renewal rate from was about seventy percent to ninety five percent. So um, oh, wow. know, the, the numbers don't lie; you can't you can't hide. So um, yeah, little things like that you can you can pick up through doing that regular reporting and oversight in the business. 
Now, I don't normally have a slogan for the podcast episode, but the, the quote, the numbers don't uh, lie, um, is probably my favorite <laughs> one for people in your role because, you know, we we do have to, um, in general, when, you, when you're when you running the business of the business, you do have to have a good culture. You've got to have good personality and whatnot, but the, the CEO and the board rely on someone to... to to actually have that 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 rigor around what's acceptable, what's unacceptable for numbers. Now, you, you sort of stole one of my questions around your tech stack, and the comment I've got around Salesforce. Uh, lots of people have tried Salesforce. Some successful, some not. Why do you think it's worked for you in your practice, and why do you potentially believe it may not have been as successful for others? If if if, if you know the answer. Um, So we made the decision uh, about eight years ago to start using Salesforce. We looked at a whole range of different platforms, but what we really wanted was the ability to have that transparency around reporting and the ability to plug in other technologies, uh, but also then to to develop it to what we needed it to do. So uh, when we first set it up, we spent a lot of time and money um, developing it to map out what we do um, in what we call opportunities, which is similar to a thread in X plan. Um, and because of the way Salesforce works, you can tweak that as needed. So it's very, uh, very easy to to adapt um, and it's very agile to make it be what we need it to be. And as we identified different areas we wanted to report on, we were able to do that as well. So I, I think for us, the reason it's been successful is because we did spend a lot of time thinking about what we wanted it to do. Um, and then if something wasn't working, we changed it. So we didn't blindly go, no, that's what it is. So we're leaving it as is. If something wasn't working or it wasn't doing what we needed it to do, then we would change that. Um, and we were able just to continue to do that week after week. So we continue to do that. We, um, at the moment, have um, an operations review working group that we've been running for about 12 months, which has looked at our whole end-to-end process um, and through that, we've redesigned the opportunities we have in Salesforce to to make sure it's fit for purpose for what we need to do um, and identified different technologies that we want to plug into that to to add more automation to what we're doing. Like what? Like what, what kind of things? I'm interested. What would you, what, what, where, where's one of the, the more progressive businesses going with technological plugins? Um, so at the moment we do use a range of different technology, but they're not all talking to each other. So, um, you know, Power BI, we use um, Zoom, Calendly, DocuSign, uh, all of those type of things, uh, 3CX, uh, we all use they're independently at the moment, but they can all be plugged into Salesforce. So um, I think we've always been pretty good at knowing what technology we needed and we have that, but the next step for us is integrating that all into that one platform. So I think that's a challenge that every business faces um, and it's a conversation I have with so many people around what works for you and and what you need the business to do and I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all approach because everyone does things slightly differently. Um, But for us, it's, you know, bringing them all into the one place, getting that automation wherever we can, thinking about where we want our people to spend time, where they add value. So it's not on data entry. It's not on, you know, putting things from one system to the next. It's on on clients at the end of the day. We're a people business. We're a service business. And that's what we want people to spend time on. It's not not on on the back end. So the technology needs to be there to support them, not not the other way around. I I always use a saying, you know, getting the right people doing the right things at the right time. And in fact, it's almost a, a VVP slogan, I suppose, self-servingly, but potentially we should be saying getting the right tech to do the right things at the right time as well, because um, yeah. uh, there, there, there's no shortage of, 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 of massive tech solutions, but the figuring out what you want out of it before you get the shiny tech is probably going to save you a lot of time and effort. Eh? Yeah. And, and that's the approach we took when we did this operations review group. And, and in that, we have a representative from each role in the business. So they then become the spokesperson for their team to say, these are our pain points. These are the things we need to automate. This is what's working and not working. Um, so then we can pick the technology based on what we need it to do rather than picking a technology and trying to make our our processes fit into that. Um, and by having the different team members involved in that working group, it gets their engagement. So then when it's time to roll out new technologies and processes, the team's already on board because they've been part of that 
design um, and it goes back to, to that value of another way. It's the team telling us what they need rather than us telling them what, what we need them to do because they're the ones doing it day in, day out. So we can't possibly know everything that, that they know. So empowering them to do that has made that change management process uh, a lot smoother as well. And, um, you know, towards the end of the podcast, we'll also talk about, you know, uh, are you looking to grow the business and how are you going to grow it? And, and the more I listen to you, if I was an, a, an advisor who was very good at advising and quite, um, and, but, but kind of almost not that good at getting organized and being passionate, I would be drawn towards this style of firm and in your style of, of, of management. Um, how many clients have you got and what sort of, and what type are they roughly just to sort of paint the overall picture? Yeah, um, so we've probably we've got about twelve hundred client groups on ongoing fee yep. arrangements. So each advisor has um, anywhere from one hundred and sixty to one hundred and ninety clients on ongoing fee arrangements. Predominantly, our clients are pre-retiree and retiree clients, um, and then probably wealth accumulators, so people who are time poor um, and just need someone to to help them sort everything out. Um, we've always taken the approach that we don't want transactional clients. So when we onboard a client, it's always looking for that long-term relationship. We don't want to just have them come in, do one financial plan and then walk away because we know that you know people don't have the time or, or the commitment to follow it through. So we think we add the most value in that ongoing relationship where they come back every year, we go through their modelling, we update it, we show them whether they're on track or not. So they understand consequences of, of inaction, um, but then also give them advice on things that they don't know about that they need to be doing to, to make sure they continue to be successful and, and get the most out of life without needing to, to go to bed worrying about what their money's doing. So um, that long-term relationship has always been at the forefront of, of what we've built. And we did spend some time uh, every few years, we, we redo our cost to serve to understand the different client groups we have um, and what it costs us to actually deliver service to them. Um, now, we did identify a, a group of clients on one of our lower ongoing fee packages who it just it didn't make commercial sense for the business. So it's a, a, a tough decision to you know look at a, a big chunk of revenue and say, are we going to give up that revenue? But when you look at the numbers and know that it's not actually making you money and your higher net worth clients are effectively subsidising those clients um, is is a tough decision to make. But we want to make sure that advisors have capacity for working with the right type of clients and, and that the clients that we do have on board um, and, and paying us the fees that they're paying are, are getting the service that they deserve. So yeah, I, I think cost to serve analysis is something we do regularly just to make sure we are on track um, and it's something the advisors get on board with as well because at the end of the day they're the ones needing to have the conversation with clients and position fees and and have those ongoing conversations um, but they're also now really great at identifying clients who don't fit our model and clients that they know won't be profitable so it's not us needing to say you need to get rid of this client it's them saying that's not the right client for us. I'm not going to onboard them to start with and then them referring them elsewhere. So again, I think that comes back to the culture we have around transparency of financials and, and business strategy and, and sharing that with the team. So there's generally no surprises about what we're doing as a business and decisions we're making because people have had input on them um, and we've also regularly communicated that in our quarterly team updates. Bree, you've got an uncanny knack of answering the questions that I'm just about to ask you. Um, so just rewinding there, so um, 160 to 190 um, retained for family units, um, uh, which which sounds pretty solid. What's the new business aspirations um, for the business um, as far as percentage? What what's And also, why I'm at it, because you'll probably answer this second yep. question as well, because you is... Um, when you worked out what wasn't profitable, what is your goal EBITDA for, for the business? So first one's the, the, the new business and the second one is what's the goal EBITDA for, for Blueprint? Yeah. Um, so new business for the existing advisors isn't very isn't a very high number because most of them are pretty close to capacity with the existing clients. So um, they all have targets around number of new clients to onboard because Naturally, um, we do tend to, to lose clients, so we've got to make sure they keep replacing them. 
So they have a probably a, a client target of around 10% growth each year. And that might equate to maybe 100, 150,000 of, of new business revenue when they onboard those clients. Um, and then obviously our, our newer advisor who has a, a much smaller client base has a higher new business number um, of around 200,000 um, just while they're beginning to, to build their business and their client base. As a business, we'd love to get to a 35% EBITDA. We're not there yet, um, but we we know what we need to do to get there. Um, and part of the things like identifying clients that are profitable, you know, helps us get there. Um, similarly, with doing the operations review, we've gone through and, and identified things we're doing in the process that we don't need to be doing um, and things we've been what, able to what, automate. What, what examples would you have there, Bree, of things that you've identified you don't think you need to do? Um, it's probably more around um, double handling of of tasks and and data entry, um, identifying things that we can automate or use technology to do. So setting up a lot more templates um, that people can personalise and use. Um, just going through and making sure the right people are doing the right tasks and they're accountable for it at each stage in the opportunity. So taking out the kind of a lot of the peer checking where someone does something, someone else checks it to make sure you're happy with it. We want to, we want people to be confident that everyone in the team is doing their job to the best of their ability and you shouldn't need to be checking someone else's work because um, I think that can encourage not laziness, but you know, a bit of lack of accountability if, if you know that someone else is going to check your work and, and catch mistakes compared to knowing that you're responsible for doing it. You're giving it to the next team for their part of the process and they're going to trust that what you've done is right. Correct, correct. So what I want to talk about now, and you've touched on it a bit, is is sort of, you know, why people join you, um, why they stay and why they grow. You've kind of hinted at something that I see as a hallmark of, of a quality practice, which is which is ownership from across the board. And and you said your journey was that you you were offered um, uh, equity in this business five years on, but that was a much more, more immature business. And to be honest, they probably just wanted to keep you. Like let's 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 be yeah. honest. Back then, um, times <laughs> have obviously changed now. But um, and when you mentioned that the advisors identify people who don't make profit, that that sounds like there's quite a few shareholders in your business. Would that be fair? Um, I think there are seven minority shareholders. Uh, so yeah, most advisors have some kind of shareholding. Um, but I think from their point of view, they have be, they have understood that they want to make sure they're dealing with high quality clients. So instead of just onboarding any client and having you know two hundred low fee paying clients, they'd rather have a smaller number of high quality clients that they can spend their time on. So I think it's it's a challenge for advisors when they first start out is to be able to say no to people because if you can get a client to agree to pay a fee of any kind, that that's a win. So I think a lot of advisors when they first start out do that because, you know, there is pressure to hit targets and to bring on new clients. So, um, you know, they, they take on anyone they can, but then they reach a certain level of, of maturity in, in, their, in their business and they begin to understand that they might not be the best clients to be dealing with. You know, they might be very time consuming um, and and not necessarily the right demographic for, that, for where they can add value. That's why you suck your brother and your sister. That's what I found. Yeah, <laughs> you do. Yep. We don't, don't have many family members left. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I think for them, part of it is, you know, having a shareholding in the business, but it's also them having that level of maturity to, to know where they want to get to individually um, and what kind of clients they they like to deal with. So um, I think going back to your question about why people join us um, and often when we're interviewing people, they, they ask about the business and um, I generally do at, at least one of the two interviews um, and given I've been here for 22 years, I think I can give a good perspective of, of why people join and why they stay. Um, and what I always say to people is it's just, um, it's a really great place to work. It very much has a, a team mentality and a family mentality. Um, everyone who joins uh, always comments about how warm and welcoming everyone is, how professional yet friendly the office environment is. Um, 
we always take the approach that we don't want to micromanage people. We'll, we'll give them the tools and the training they need to, to do their job, but we'll leave it up to them to figure out how they want to do that. So give them autonomy over, over what they're doing. And again, ask them to tell us what we need to give them and, and what we can do better. Um, I actually love it when a new person starts, and especially if they're newer to the industry, because they just have a completely different perspective from us. And, and we're so used to doing what we're doing. We've been doing it day in, day out. So having people challenge us. And sometimes there's a reason we have to do it a particular way, but um, we don't know what we don't know. So we want people to, to ask us those questions. Um, and I think the the team has a great culture. Everyone gets along really well. Um, you know, a lot of people socialise outside of work. Do you think that's because you've clearly defined the roles and that people know when they're doing a good job? Is that Because I'm of the opinion that Sometimes people say we're a fun place to work and whatnot, but at the end of the day, no one knows if they've actually done the thing that they should be doing. But if you clearly yeah. define roles, then you actually give people freedom to celebrate wins. Yeah, I, I think so. And, and often the feedback I get from newer staff members who've worked in other practices is um, it's around how structured um, and uh, structured the business is, how we've got processes in place. So you're not second guessing things. You're not wondering what you do or don't need to do. Um, there's very clear processes um, and there's a lot of support around to to help you be successful at, at what you need to do. So, um, you know, I think we know where people add value and we don't want them to be worrying about, you know, processes and, and what they need to do. And if, if, if I do this, who's going to pick up that bit? So having that confidence to know that the system is um, tried and, and tested and, and that it works gives people that confidence to to let go a little bit and, and focus on on what they need to do and, and be accountable for, for their part in that process. Do you have any tools that you've used for HR? So any of the uh, sort of what, what's what's the methodology and, and, and that you use in your business and is it backed up by any tech tools? Um, so earlier this year, we started using Employment Hero and previous to that, we had used Cornerstone, but we, we've used, a, I guess, a technology solution for a number of years because we wanted to have that centralised system that records um, any of those kind of HR conversations that we're having. Also, because there's different people doing those performance reviews, we wanted to make sure that everyone was getting the same experience. So it's not just people who report to me have this experience and people who report to another manager get this experience. It's trying to streamline it so everyone has the same thing and, and having the technology solution that sits behind it to make sure that we can see who's had reviews and who hasn't. Um, but then also it collates all the feedback you've put in there so you can look at previous reviews to see what conversations you've had, uh, what goals you've set for for the team member and, and hold them accountable and revisit their development plans. Just streamlining that and bringing that together, um, it just makes it easier for the people who, who need to do that work. Well, I think it's also, I mean, at, at, at VBP, we use Coltramp and we have such a vast amount of people mm -hmm. that you have to have something. Um, and although um, th th there's very low attrition, especially in the role of general manager, considering you've been there consecutively 20 years, by having by having um, a, a clearly documented history from a HR conversation perspective, if there ever is a change of management or a change of middle management, they're not starting from scratch. They can actually go back and review sort of uh, the, the history of what's happened. But let's yeah. say, for instance, then um, people have done the right thing, how does Blueprint celebrate success? Because it feels like it's, it's, it's a very, very structured business and you have facilitated being successful, but what, what does fun look like? What does success look like? Um, so we have uh, what we call a WOW award. So it's something where if someone does something that really stands out, be it you know a new idea or get some great client feedback or, or anything like that, um, that they post that on Employment Hero to share that success with the team. Um, so that gets acknowledged and, and they get a $100 gift card just as a, a token of, a, of appreciation. Um, we then talk about those things in team meetings to give shout outs to people who have, you know, helped each other out or, you know, we share client testimonials and uh, we, we get quite a, a high number of, of good Google reviews. So we always celebrate those successes with the team as well. 
Um, outside of that, we do have annual um, awards. So each role in the business um, essentially has uh, has an award, so advisor of the year, power planner of the year, and so on. Um, and that's based purely on their KPI metric. So it's not not a popularity contest. It's purely based on on their performance of of what we need them to do in their role. And then we also have a, a team member of the year award, which is a, a team or a peer voted award to acknowledge the the person what do that they get? lives. What's in- the goodies? Um, so actually, this year we've just introduced the uh, the reward for that to be to attend the AMP annual conference. So we're licensed by AMP, so all the award winners uh, get a trip interstate to to attend that conference. Um, please don't so be we'll, Perth. We'll please don't that. be Perth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's I would feel sorry for someone if that's what happens in the year that they win. <laughs> we might have to look at a, another conference. Maybe, maybe. So I'm going to ask a, a question. With the WOW, have yourself or David ever received one? Uh, yes. Yep, we have. Good, yep. so good. It's, it's, it's so many it's people, not just so many people set these saying things it up. To people. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 It's yeah, good. So it's, it's good that it's, you've actually done it. It's all levels of the business. Yeah. So it's, it's not just me saying, okay, so-and-so has done this, so-and-so has done that. It's it's peers nominating each other and, and nominating yep. advisors and myself. So it is... um. Probably testament to the culture of the business that it's not, I guess, hierarchical in that way where, you know, everyone wants to celebrate everyone's successes and acknowledge how we support each other as a team. So with your, with the uh, bringing people through, and, and you've got, you know, a history now of, of bringing people through associate advisors in their PY, I always like to give yeah. a shout out to the Ensemble platform. There's a whole section on there for people doing their PY, which is sponsored yep. by CFS. So thank you very much yep. for that. We're and if using you, if that. You, thank you, Roxy. Well, oh, there you go. I didn't even know that. So <laughs> there you go. We, it's Ensemble Bingo. So we've just, we just had yep. a few. Um, and I, I note in your, in your uh, education history that you did a, an MBA um, uh, in 2018-19, with the people coming through, do you sit down with them at all levels and go through their training plan and, and maybe give some examples of that, please? Yeah, so um, as part of doing their performance reviews, we do more kind of ad hoc uh, professional development plans with them. So it's sitting down and talking about, uh, you know, what their future goals are, if there's particular areas that they want more exposure to, um, and helping them set goals of what they want to achieve. So rather than us saying to them, this is what we want to see, it's them articulating what's important to them and, and what their timeframes are and then us supporting them to do that. Um, sometimes that's doing more education. Sometimes it's, you know, mirroring someone doing a different role. Um, it might be um, conferences, ongoing education, um, or it might just be more on the job training and and for some people they do want to continue to progress but we've got other people who are really happy in their role so for them it's probably more around becoming more of an expert in their role rather than new skills to to progress to other roles Um, so we do have that conversation with people um, but the approach that we take is that we want them to own it so if if they don't tell us what they need we're not mind readers so we want to support them on their journey and we will always do that. We've got an educational assistance program to help people with qualifications and, and what they need to do. Um, but if someone's not passionate about the goals and what they want to achieve, then you're making them do it for the sake of doing it. So we want to go on that Correct. journey with them, but we want them to be the ones leading that journey. It's it's pretty clear from uh, the conversation that, that um, you're always looking after the various stakeholders. So you're making sure the client's aren't cross subsidizing other clients. You're making sure that the the advisors are giving off clients to to juniors to bring them through. And it's a business structure like that that lends itself to quite good profitability. But with this profit, um, do you do any charitable programs, any community orientated things? Yeah, so uh, we've been working with Sorry about camp- that. I tipped you into that one. So no, that's okay. <laughs> Um, we've been working with the Cancer Council for I think this is our eighth year now. Um and we work with them in a number of different ways. So we do sponsor an annual research award where we provide um, money that goes towards um, early career research. Um, we also are part of a pro bono financial advice program. So for people going through cancer who need financial advice, um, we provide that support to them. And that's something that all our advisors are involved in Um 
which which they find you know it is challenging, but it's also it's really rewarding. Yeah, a- absolutely. It's how I remember um because it was I think the FPA might well back in the day the FPA might have been involved as well, and um I tell you what it, it, it gives you perspective on life when you're uh, you're after to do a financial yeah. plan for someone who's not going to live to the end of the year. It's 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 one of the things that planners do that I wish the media would just talk more about. To be honest, yeah. And I think then when they're talking to to other clients, it just gives more perspective. So when you're talking about, you know, what are your goals, you know, actually go and live life, you know, don't save money for the sake of spending it, you know, what are your lifestyle goals, enjoy life while you can. But then also, you know, conversations around insurances, which are are getting more and more expensive, Um, you know, being able to say hand on heart that you know that they can help people in the time of need. It just gives that that more perspective to those conversations for the advisors as well. So, um, yeah, we, we've enjoyed being part of that program. Um, we also have a quarterly volunteering day for the team. So each quarter we'll organise a, a different charity that we go and do work with. So often that's with the Cancer Council and it might be doing a cook a meal for people staying in um, particular lodges uh, we have often done it with Food Bank. We've done Ronald McDonald. Um, we ask the team for different charities that they want to go and support, um, and then they have a, a day per quarter to go and do that. Then the other I, thing we I do is around. Ideally, hope that you've got. Sorry, ideally hope you've got some decent cooks. It'd be it'd be pretty bad if you volunteer and then they go, "No, I'm I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. Thanks." <laughs> No, we're um we're we're very lucky. We've got a number of good cooks in the business who are always very generous with bringing in um extra lunches and morning teas. So we're all very well fed here. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. the The last thing we do is around fundraising, where we have an annual fundraising event called the Girls' Night In. Um, and we actually just had this on the weekend and raised twenty nine thousand dollars for the Cancer Council. Um, Congratulations. And I also had the AMP Foundation agree to dollar match that. So it'll be almost $60,000 that we raised for the Cancer Council, which we're really proud of. Um, and that's well, we, the we should eighth give AMP year a shout that we've out done because, that. Yeah. So, sorry, there's a bit of a delay there. That's on me. But we, sh- we need to give AMP a shout out for that. That's um, They get yeah. maligned sometimes. But that, that, that one thing that they've done for you guys... Um, is significant. And so um, if they're listening, well done for that. Well done, AMP. Yeah. So uh, yeah, that that's the eighth year we've done it um, and we'll continue to do it because it's just, it's a, a great night to get people together. And we have about 80 people come along to that and a huge amount of businesses provide prizes that we use for raffles and, and auctions. Um, and it yeah, just continues continues to grow and raise money for a really important cause. So we're we're proud of that achievement. No, well, and the passion's evident. Um, in relation to the future of the business, you've given me a, a bit of a, a sort of uh, where we are now. Um, when I'm looking at your 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 business, um, I haven't really touched on uh, the other services you provide. You, you're a pure play financial planning. I believe you do estate planning as well, or, or refer out. Refer that out. So each advisor has um, a number of uh, what we call center of influences or referral partners that they work yep. with, where we've got reciprocal agreements in place with. So, what, what would be some examples of that, Bree? Just for people uh, listening, accounting, mortgage broking, yep. uh, lawyers. So, um, I think we we know what we're good at, and we want to make sure we focus on that and align ourselves with professionals who are experts at what they do. So. Uh, we can work closely with those people or those other professionals to bring everything together for clients, um, and, and that's the the approach that that we've taken as a business, just to focus on financial planning for now. But never say never. So when I'm looking at the the business um, as far as growth, um, it looks like you're probably not just in the market for new advisors, but you'd be uh, from previous discussions, you'd be happy to take. Uh, or look at look at bringing, for instance, an advice practice, or maybe a small uh, one or two person practice who is really yeah. good with their clients, but maybe wants to leave their legacy of their relationship with their clients in a business that's probably going to you know be around in twenty or thirty years. Um, what yeah. what are you in the market for next year to, to grow? Um, because five ten percent growth isn't going to do it. You know, like that's that's my thoughts. No. no. So I, I think um, we've been pretty successful uh, probably in the last couple of years where we've purchased a number of client bases to to help 
uh, fill up advisor capacity and, and provide clients for some of our newer advisors. Um, and the way the business is structured is, as I mentioned before, we can replicate the pods that we have. We've got the systems and processes in place. So um, for us, organic growth would be great, um, but also very open to you know, the opportunity to purchase client bases or, or smaller businesses. Like he said, you know, there's a lot of one and two man bands out there who are really great financial advisors, but don't have the the time or the energy to to run the business. And, and that's something that we can take off them. So, you know, having that opportunity to join an established business um, and be able to, to let go of the back office stuff and just focus on on clients and, and where they add the most value um, is is something that we're very open to um, those opportunities as they come along. And I've got a question just to, I'm looking for, you know, maybe impart some knowledge or some magic dust um, on, on some of the listeners. So um, you mentioned that you have 15 people um, working with you um, offshore. So 15 people working for, with VBP, which is quite a large number. And practices yeah. um, with, with 28 people in Australia to have 15 people there, um, you've obviously done something right. What what do you think uh, sort of two or three sort of people management things that Blueprint does that makes that work where others haven't been able to pull it off? Uh, look, I, th- I think we haven't always got it right, but we've learned from our mistakes. And I think what's really important to us is treating the offshore team like they're part of our team. So anything our team does here, the offshore team does the same. So we've organised a Christmas party for our team Uh, They get Christmas presents like the rest of the team. Um, You know, we attend the conferences over there so we can get to know them. Um, We've got five team members coming over to Perth to see us next year. Oh, wow. Um, They have bonus plans in place. So um, we we don't want them just to feel like a a VBP employee. They're they're part of the Blueprint team as well. So um, I think just understanding that they are part of the team and treating them that way um, gets a lot of loyalty um, and and communication is really key. I think working with an offshore team, you know, there can be a, a big cultural difference and the way we work can be very different to how people in the Philippines work and, and that's nothing wrong with that. That's just the difference in cultures. But having an understanding of that and trying to build those relationships so people are more comfortable so you can have a two-way communication so it's not just – instruction giving and instruction taking it's a it's a working relationship where you know they are the expert at what they do so they need to tell us and be able to give us feedback so we can um, support them as we do our our team members here is is something that's important to us and similarly with their career progression it's understanding what they want to do and as our team gets bigger it's easier to do that because there's more opportunities to provide them different challenges within our um, team over there instead of them needing to look elsewhere within the VBP team. So they're probably the the three key things for us working with an offshore team. If I could bottle that up, Bree, um, that would be be awesome. Yeah, the common thread is that <laughs> that um, if you just treat them the same, that, that, that's it's, that's just the beginning point. If 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 you treat them the same, they've got the same aspirations, yeah. then they'll deliver. And and you know it it is an engine room podcast, and and getting that engine room right now. The part of my passion for for doing um, this series is to bring forward the people behind the advisors who, who run the business. What advice do you have to aspiring young um, individuals currently working in financial services who would who would like to ascend into doing a GM or or, or maybe don't want to take the advisor role? What what sort of your tips on yeah. how they should approach? I suppose their bosses. Yeah. I think, um, you know, often when I talk to people who are just starting out on the in, in the industry, they don't think of management in financial planning as an option. You know, they kind of know of para planning and financial planning and don't know much outside of that. So I think um, from my experience, being able to try the different roles in the business so you've got a good understanding of, of how each of them work um, has added a lot of value with then when I need to do my role because you do have a good understanding of where each stakeholder is coming from. Um, but also, you know, having the qualifications in financial planning is one thing. Um, spending time on doing management studies can add a lot of value as well because, 
you, you know, you could be a, a highly qualified advisor and, and para planner, but that's very different from needing to run a business and make business decisions. So, you know, spending that time doing further education around management where you can, you know, as you would if you're becoming a financial advisor, you'd spend time studying that. So, you know, take the opportunity where you can to to build your knowledge. Um, and something I've been really fortunate in the last couple of years is, you know, as businesses are starting to grow and, and more businesses do have practice managers and general managers, it's um, building networks. So, you know, we it's often hard when you go to conferences, everything's aimed at financial advisors, not often is it aimed at, um, you know, people who run the business. So having forums to, to get together and, and peer networks where you can ask each other questions and share ideas and share best practice. There's no right or wrong. It's just having those open, transparent conversations and, you know, having someone you can call and go, hey, this has come up. How have you dealt with it before? Um, it makes life a lot easier. You don't have to do it all by yourself. It's use those friendships and networks that you have. It's 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 hilarious that we've got continuing professional development points for for the advisors, but we've we've got absolutely nothing for that, that that's mandated for people who work and are part of the advice process. And you're exactly right. And um, having having those those that lack of 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 targeting towards practice managers um, is the reason. Yep, I want it. To, so you know, every year I want to highlight forty to fifty people who people can look up to as far as saying, well. Here is a cohort of people, and hopefully, in the future, there will be practice management forums for it. For um, and I'm sure there are groups out there doing it, coaching groups, and and and, and definitely Ensemble does it. But um, no, just to just to carve that out as a vocation um, is is I think works because uh, you know this. I've been a financial planner, and if I didn't have a good system behind me, then um, you know, I'd just be spinning my wheels with whiteboards and. And yeah. um, and not much else. So um, the yep. the other other question, I suppose that the final question I wanted to ask was the vision of the future of um, the the practices. So what do you see them? Do you see that your type of practice is just going to keep going and getting bigger and more industrial, or do you see you know space for hyper specialization? Or what, what's your personal thoughts? No wrong or right answer. Um, look, I think for for most people. Uh, the businesses will need to to reach a certain level of scale. I think for smaller businesses, it's hard to have the bandwidth to focus on all the things that you need to be across to be successful. So I think, uh, you know, for, for most businesses, growth to, you know, probably a, a medium-sized business uh, makes sense for them to be profitable and, and be successful at what they're doing. Um, in regards to specialisation, I think it depends on on who your target client is. So, um, you know, a, a lot of clients prefer working with more boutique financial practices, you know, people like us. Um, and then there'll always be people who don't want to pay for advice and they'll want to go to the industry funds or their super fund or, or whatever that might be. But, um, you know, I think there's a lot of people out there who need advice and they're all different types of advice. So I don't think there's one right way of doing it. It's about finding your niche um, and knowing what works for you and, and where you can add the most value for those clients um, to, to be successful. So, yeah, I, th I think scale is definitely something to aim for, but, you know, figure out what model works for you and, and what you want to focus on advice-wise. Sage advice, Bree. Look, um, I'd like to thank you for, for really unpacking a lot to do with how you have managed to grow the business, how you've worked with the stakeholders in the business, the open-mindedness of the board. Um, the, the loyalty factor is insane, you know, as far as there's so much tenure there, especially with yourself. I don't know whether I'm going to wish you another successful 21 years in the business because that might be a bit, a bit of a stretch, but I'd like to personally thank you on behalf of Ensemble for, for sharing some insights today and I, I wish you all the success in the future. You're welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Cheers. Cheers.